Next up, Scott from insisttrue.com. Take it away. Thank you. Great. Excellent. So uh, I'll talk to you a little bit today about how we use uh, big data at Ancestry.com. Um, first of all, let me just give a little background on what, we, uh, on what Ancestry.com does for those who are not familiar with the company. Um, actually, before that, let me ask, how many of you guys use uh, Hadoop? What about uh, HBase? Oh, all right. Um, just want to get a little context. So uh, at Ancestry.com, we're the largest online resource for family history. And uh, we've got 2.7 million paying subscribers. We, had, we did about $480 million in revenue last year. And we've got offices in eight countries. And uh, in order to give you a little bit perspective on kind of what we do at Ancestry.com to illustrate a little bit. I'll, I'll tell you a little story about uh, my family history that I think is common to uh, what our subscribers experience on a daily basis. So when my great-great-grandfather was four years old, his mother put him on a ship called the Utah to come from Denmark to the United States. And in those days, if you couldn't pay passage to come to the United States, then you could do a contract where you would work for somebody when you arrived in the United States and uh, they would pay your passage and you'd pay off that debt. So there was a woman named Mary Belcher that agreed to pay passage for my great-great-grandfather when he was four years old. I don't know what she thought when she found out that he was only four years old because she was expecting somebody to help with the school that she, uh, that she ran. But in any case, she took care of him and uh, cared for him until he was 15 years old. And the story goes that he lied about his age and joined the Pony Express. Um, I guess you had to be 16, year old, 16 years old to join the Pony Express at that time. So how did I make these discoveries about my great-great-grandfather? Well, what I did was I started a family tree. I entered information about myself and, and my grandparents. And then I started to see these hints, these green leaves here, that indicate that Ancestry has made a discovery on your behalf. And so I found an immigration record about my great-great-grandfather. And sure enough, he was four years old, and he, uh, nobody else from his family on that ship. Um, and I attached that record of that immigration record to his profile in my family tree. And then I began to see other people who had also attached that immigration record to somebody in their family tree. And I discovered other cousins who shared this common ancestor. They had photos and stories. In fact, here's a photo of my great-great-grandfather that I didn't know existed. Uh, I also took a DNA test. We offer a DNA test and found uh, distant cousins who had stories about other ancestors. And so we use lots and lots of data in order to uh, do, improve our information retrieval algorithms, do record matching. Uh, we do some you know, predictive analytics. We do our, our whole DNA pipeline is based on processing massive amounts of data. So I'll kind of talk about these a little bit and how we do this at Ancestry.com. First of all, let me just talk about some of the uh, content, the data that we have. We have uh, over 12 billion records and images, 10 petabytes of data. And we've worked with government agencies um, to uh, collect this institutional content. It's birth, marriage, death records, immigration records, census records. It's war records, just to name a few types of records. We've got over 30,000 different collections of different types of records. Um, in, in addition to that, we've got lots of customer contributed content. And so we, we have our customers who have built over 50 million family trees with more than 5 billion people in these family trees. Um, and many, many of these trees have stories and photos uploaded to these trees. In addition, our customers associate the records that I talked about a moment ago with people in their trees. And so not only do they contribute content, but they uh, also provide structure to the content that we have and we offer. In addition, we have behavioral data. And so every time that a user associates some content with somebody in their family tree, they're making a judgment that we can use for training data in order to train our information retrieval algorithms. We're able to know a whole lot about our customer behavior, you know, the search parameters, where they're searching, who they're searching for. 
what sort of collections they're interested in. And so uh, if Sarah, for example, searches for a record for her great, great, I guess, great grandfather in this case in uh, Ireland, an immigration record from Ireland uh, in the 1860s, well, you can probably assume that uh, they would be interested in information about the Irish potato famine that caused such devastation in Ireland and, and caused so many people to immigrate to the United States. And so, you know, uh, Amazon is able to say, you like this book, you'll probably like this music. In a similar way, based on our customers' behaviors, we're able to offer them relevant information, either records, specific data, or, you know, context and color that can help them understand their family history. So you're probably all familiar with the pedigree view of a family tree. Uh, there's other ways to view, visualize uh, these trees. And along the bottom, are, these trees are essentially directed at cyclical graphs. And so along the bottom right-hand side, you can see you know, different shapes of trees. They come in all shapes and sizes. They look kind of like viruses here on this uh, slide. But uh, on the top right here uh, is a 2,000 node tree. And you can kind of see the structure there. And uh, initially, um, we didn't have a lot of social features on our side, and our trees were very deep, and they were uh, very balanced. But as we added social features to our side, it made it easier for our customers to collaborate with cousins. Uh, then they started becoming broader as they added co living cousins and, and, uh, and changed the shape of, of the trees that were being created. Uh, probably the most interesting, uh, uh, or rather... I guess what I'd like to do is maybe just take you a little bit through the transition that we made into um, Hadoop and HBase and talk a little bit of specifically about how we use those for some of our uh, technologies and, and, and in more detail about how we do, do our DNA processing. So at Ancestry, you know, it's, for a long time we've been doing information retrieval on massive amounts of data, you know, petabytes and petabytes of data. but and we built uh, our own proprietary technology for, for doing that. And so about four years ago, we wanted to improve our information retrieval algorithms with machine learning. And so we went out and we hired some data scientists. And, um, and we thought, well, they'll just use our proprietary technology. Well, of course, they wanted to use the tools of the trade. And so you know, Hadoop and, and MapReduce and R were introduced into our tool set at that time. And, uh, and so we used that for... Um, we use that to improve our record linking and our other information, you know, uh, learn to rank and, and those sort of things. Uh, I won't talk a lot about those because I think that those are well understood uses of Hadoop and, and machine learning. Um, in addition, we, we, when we became comfortable with Hadoop, we, we tried to use those same techniques for predictive analytics. And so we wanted to predict churn, for example. And so we created a model that actually was highly predictive of churn, and uh, had about a thousand features, used random forest algorithm to uh, predict churn. Uh, one of the key learnings was that just because something's predictive doesn't mean that it's actionable. With a thousand features, you know, you can say that any given person based on some combination of a thousand attributes is likely to churn, but that didn't help us very much. I mean, the best we could do is maybe give them a discount. On the other hand, predicting the next best discovery to present to a user, being highly predictive was sufficient because we didn't need to correlate it to any specific action. We just needed to know what the next best you know, discovery was to present to our users. Additionally, we, use, uh, we, we do natural language processing and entity extraction in order to... Um, one example of this is uh, obituary, our obituary collection. We're able... Uh, or our uh, city directories. Uh, these collections were very poor performing collections because we just did term search on these collections. Uh, when we were able to uh, do some, uh, or some entity extraction and provide um, context, we knew a name is a name, a place is a place, a date is a date, and even know, you know that the relationship between people in the record, well, who's the deceased and who are the children of the deceased, it, it took what was some of our worst performing collections out of our 30,000 uh, collections and put some of those collections into our top 10 best, uh, best collections. So I'm going to talk about DNA processing a little bit in more detail. Just covered some of these things in just really briefly. But um, I want to just try to do a little bit of a deep dive for our DNA processing. 
and, and talk specifically about kind of data science behind that. So um, spit in a tube, pay $99 and learn your past. Uh, that's a term coined by Derek Harris who, um, at GigaOM to describe what, we're, what we do. And uh, DNA is, um, you know, it's found in all living cells. It's the genetic material that encodes the information to create and maintain life. You receive, everybody receives their DNA from their parents. You get half from your mother and half from your father. And it's like a bread crumb that your ancestors leave. And so small changes in DNA over time give us a view into your, into history. And, um, and so what we're able to do is we're able to take uh, your DNA and we're able to tell you what your ethnicity is, you know, how French are you, how English are you, even getting more granular than that over time. The more data we feed this, the more granular we can get. We can tell you what part of England maybe your, you know, your ancestors were from. Uh, in addition, we can match you with cousins and we can tell you you're likely to be a cousin with this other person. For fourth cousins, we're 90% accurate. And a fourth cousin is a shared ancestor between seven and 10 generations ago or 150 to 300 years ago. And uh, third cousins, second cousins, first cousins, even much more accurate. So how do we do this? Uh, for every new DNA sample that comes in, we take it and we compare it against every other sample in our database. And um, we're able to then apply some statistical algorithms to determine, well, both your ethnicity and, uh, you know, who your cousins are. Um, so a little bit of a case study here. So uh, we take 700,000 SNPs from your DNA and we have to then compare that against everybody else in our database. Uh, each SNP compared to every other SNP from every other person in our database. An N squared problem that w you know, quickly gets out of hand. As you can see along the bottom line there, that's, our, um, that's, uh, that's the pool size of our DNA database. And the black line is the number of cousin matches. And um, you know, the good news is that it, it, it goes quadratic and, uh, and, and so this network effect allows us to find lots of cousins for almost everybody who, who d takes a DNA test. When we had 10,000 samples, um, on average, we'd find one cousin match for every other customer. With over 200,000 samples, we can find, on average, over 40 fourth cousin only matches and, and more third and second cousins uh, for every other person in our, in our database. So let's dive in a little bit to what we had to do, what we, what we do in our DNA pipeline. Um, how do we do this? So what, the, what we've done is we've taken some academic algorithms that are pretty good and that just get better and better with lots of data and, um, and we've created this pipeline that tells you your ethnicity and, and who your cousins are. Now the problem is that these academic algorithms uh, are you know, not built to scale. And so uh, you put a thousand samples through germline and that's a whole lot. And, um, and, and so what we needed to do is we needed to create um, algorithms that we could parallelize before we could put them onto Hadoop and, and, and make them scale. Uh, let's see, it's, um, admixture is another example of an algorithm. These algorithms were created, you know, by people at Columbia University. Um, so what we did is we, we started out, you know, the previous slide showed us running these algorithms on a Hadoop cluster, but we started out with a scale-up approach where we just had a beefy box and the box just kept getting beefier and beefier and more expensive, and, and that was just untenable. It just wasn't going to work. As you can see, um, the processing time begins to go quadratic as well. I and mean, we like the network effect when it comes to cousin matches. When it comes to processing time, we don't like it so much. And so, um, and so, uh, with this, we were quickly approaching the point at which, where we had 120,000 samples, it would take for an additional 1,000 samples, would take 
over four weeks to run the process. And, you know, that just wasn't going to work. So I'm going to use uh, the example of the characters in uh, Battlestar Galactica to, to, to illustrate kind of how we do this. So basically what we do is we take these 700,000 SNPs from your DNA, and it comes in as a series of A, C's, T's, and G's, if you remember your high school biology. And so for, you see, we've got a small snippet from Starbuck and Adama there, or uh, we'll just use those small snips to illustrate the example. We won't use the, the, whole, the whole genome, but it, it applies. And so what we do is we break it down into these words uh, of A, C's, T's, G's, and A's, so that we can use to do the comparisons. And then we create a hash table, and we use it to store the comparison information, with the hash key being the value of the string in that word, along with the position on the chromosome on the, uh, in the genome. So uh, here you can see that uh, Starbuck has uh, an ACT GNA at position zero uh, that does not match Adama, but at positions one and two, there is a match. And it turns out that, that HBase is a really good way to store this. It's a really good data store to use for, for this particular purpose. You know, it's open source. It runs on HDFS, so it has built-in redundancy. We can scale it by simply adding additional look nodes. Uh, it's kind of this weird uh, combination of a spreadsheet and a hash table. You can have unlimited rows. You can have sparse data, so there's no penalty for empty cells. And there's a you know a really there's some really good support and work being done by companies like Facebook and Salesforce.com to continue to develop uh, HBase. So we found a couple of matches between Starbuck and Hadama. Does this mean they're rel they're related? Well, it might. So this is where we apply our statistical algorithm, and it's based on the number of words that match and actually the length of those, those, uh, those matches. So if you have multiple words in, in sequence that match, even better. All right, so now what do we, what do, we do if we want to see how Baltar, uh, if he's related? Uh, so HBase holds the data. And adding, adding columns is really easy. And, you know, there's no penalty for, for having a sparse matrix. And so uh, each new DNA sample adds a column, and one indicates that the user has that value at that location. So once we've entered Baltar's information, we can then enter the, mat the segment matches for Baltar. And here are the updated tables after adding that information. And so you can see on uh, chromosome number two, uh, these segments and, and these locations, you can see um, basically what the inf matching information is. And this is a real simple example, but it's exactly what we do. So now what if we want to add four more, uh, find out if you know, the rest of the, the cast is related? or if we want to find out if 4,000 more people are related. So how do, we, how do we do that? Well, of course, we just run it in parallel on Hadoop. And so, uh, you know, we, we do batch sizes of 1,000 DNA samples. Each mapper will take a single chromosome from a single person. And as you can see in this graph here, you know, we were quickly headed for disaster. Um, but as soon as we implemented this on top of Hadoop and HBase, uh, it, uh, it has run really smoothly. And we can just add new nodes to, to the cluster to scale as needed. So here are the projected run times in green. Uh, and then in red along the bottom, that's the actual run time since we've introduced the solution. All right, so how am I doing? Time? Great. So let me just talk about a few lessons learned. Uh, we started out with kind of a cast of characters on this project. We had some bioinformatics, you know, PhDs, some scientists, and they thought they could code, but, you know, because they do that in their research, but they know, they, you know, when it comes to releasing production level code that can scale and, and be performant um, and reliable, well, 
Yeah, we had some issues. Software engineers, they thought they understood the, the biology. You know, they've, they had biology in high school. They can read science papers. But um, um, for a while, we kind of struggled until we put them in the same location, made them sit side by side and talk every day. And this has been hugely helpful to us. And so we we're trying to apply that to all of our DNA science teams. I mean, I'm sorry, all of our data science teams. And so what, what we've found, at least at Ancestry, is that we have to embed our data science scientists into the actual engineering teams and make them talk every day. It improves the feature engineering, improves the domain knowledge, improves the likelihood that engineers will be build systems that can actually incorporate the data science. Otherwise, too often we end up with data science that's academic and can't be used in our live systems. Uh, other lessons learned. Prototyping is key to overcoming resistance to change. At Ancestry, it's WebOps that's resistant to change. And to some extent, we've built them that way. We say to WebOps, you guys are responsible for, for eliminating risk and making sure the system never goes down. And we say to the developers, you guys are responsible for delivering features to the customer as fast as possible. And so, um, and, and so you know, WebOps is resistant to change. What we've had to do there uh, is to say, you know, developers, you guys go off on your own and build a prototype. Prototype, uh, you know, seeing is believing with the prototype. And so uh, I think the second thing we've had to do is we've had to bring developers and WebOps together and say, you know what, WebOps, you guys are on the hook for delivering features fast, and developers, you guys are on the hook for, for having reliable systems. And so we have a common goal. But beyond that, um, you know, prototyping is key to overcoming resistance to change, I believe. Um, it's uncanny how technical architecture follows an organization. And so if you want to decouple systems, you have to decouple the organization. If you want tightly uh, integrated, if you want something tightly integrated, you have to tightly integrate the organization back to the data science and the engineering teams. And then, you know, data scientists are hard to find. And so we've had to take internal people who have some ability to uh, understand statistics and, uh, and can code, and we've just had to train them. And you know, another thing we've done is we've got lots of people doing research in, at universities, and we find them crawling our data quite a bit. And so they'll crawl and try to scrape our census records. So first of all, we shut them off, but then we go hire them. And so that leads me to believe that if you have a large data set and can make it available for academic research, then you could create yourself a pipeline of potentially good data science candidates because 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 they know how to deal with large amounts of data, but they also know your data pretty well because they've been using it. Uh, and finally, um, at Ancestry, you know, we're constantly learning, and the it's really great. There's an open culture in the data in the kind of big data world, data science world, and we found that people at Facebook and LinkedIn and and Netflix and uh, Pinterest, you know, they're willing to share their stories if you're willing to reciprocate. Uh, those are just a few lessons learned. So, questions? Good, thank you. Questions? Yep. Margaret again. Margaret Ost. Um, yes, what, what would you say, besides just adding more data to work on in terms of uh, more chaotic data, what are your next ambitions? Well, you know, I, I think that there's studies that have shown at Stanford that more data is better than better algorithms, you know, is, is more important than better algorithms. And so certainly uh, we find that as well. Data is key and actually back to the first talk you know logging is probably the number one thing we could do better because we have massive amounts of data but um, boy if we could log more data that's the number one thing I would well the number one thing we are working on doing is just logging more data we can never get enough data great oh, one more uh, Serge Gecker at Timeform US um, how often or how rampant are false positives at Ancestry.com, and how do you deal with them? 
Yeah, that, ooh, that's a big one. At Ancestry.com, that's a big one. I'll tell you why. Because uh, uh, I'd say back in the day, um, there's a lot of junk genealogy. So that means everybody wanted to be related to um, royalty. And so professional genealogists would show you how you were related to loyal, royalty, right? Because they'd get paid. So, uh, you know, false positives tend to be self-reinforcing because then on Ancestry, you know, somebody else sees that. Uh, and adds it to their tree, which adds to the false positives. And it's something, quite frankly, that you know um, we're trying to deal with by by bringing in our own systems to provide judgments and relying on those judgments. Also, by rating users based on their, you know, uh, I don't know how good they are at genealogy, and then we we overweight for people that we trust and. and uh, and, and by doing that, you know, hopefully the false positives can be drowned out of the system by just waiting for trusted judgments. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Great. One last one. Hi, David Chala, Yodel. I was just wondering if you could just add some more detail and colors to uh, how you got the data scientists and the developers to uh, work closer together and, yeah. and more collaboratively. What, what was the – was there – did you build a bridge between them somehow? Yeah, yeah. No, that's. I'll tell you, it's it's maybe this is common sense, and but or or maybe not. Um, you actually have to sit them next to each other, right? <laughs> so you actually have to physically change where they're sitting. Uh, that's what I found. And so um, uh, we'd say you guys talk more, but they, they don't talk more. Or you know what? Here, let's just have this meeting once a week, but it's just a waste. So. We found that you have to just physically sit them side by side. Simple as that. And and say, well, and also say, here's your goal, and you don't you only have one goal, and it's the same goal, and you sit and you're sitting side by side to accomplish this goal. Great. Thank you very much, Scott. Yeah.